Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast, a weekly podcast for information security defenders, where we bring you discussions on best practices, tools, and implementation for enterprise security. Now, here are your hosts for today's show, Andy Ja and Adam Brewer. Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast. I'm Andy, your host. And I'm Adam, your co-host. Episode 54, Adam. Last week, we talked about MDM misconceptions, and there was a small concept that we talked about where if a company installs an EDR agent on your device, that they may be able to gather some metadata. For example, on an iPhone, they could tell from the EDR agent possibly that you're talking to Apple iMessage servers, but we clearly stated that because iMessages are end-to-end, the EDR agent wouldn't be able to read those iMessages. Right. So there's this dichotomy of privacy and security where some people think it's equivalent, but in reality, they're not the same. They are related in the same field, but we often say that it's kind of like a Venn diagram where there are things that are just privacy there are things that are just security and then there's certainly things that are related right so one of the points i'd like to make about this whenever we get on like the security versus privacy thing is you know there are internet providers that are sometimes seen or not internet providers but internet services applications that are sometimes seen as having a less privacy focused bent than others and i'll give two examples amazon and google Now, Amazon and Google may not have the best privacy record in the world. However, I don't think anybody doubts their cybersecurity chops. They're both very secure services. I feel very confident storing my payment card information with Amazon and using Amazon to make purchases. I feel very confident that Google does a really good job of securing their services. They're really, really good at that. Now, as far as them scraping my data and and monetizing it and all the things they do that I don't care for so much, that's maybe less privacy centric, but they can still be good at security. I think that's a good example of two really, really strong tech companies that have really good cybersecurity posture, but have lousy privacy posture. And I, I, that's, that's one example. And, you know, we're going to kind of unpack those concepts a little bit more today. Something came across my feed a few weeks ago. So this is a little bit older, but I still wanted to talk about it tonight because we tied in that MDM conversation last week for misconceptions, as well as it, this affects me personally. I We're going to talk about Proton Mail and some of the news that was released about them possibly gathering some IP addresses of an activist that ended up uh, getting handed over to the Swiss government and that activist ended up getting arrested. And if you've been listening to the show, you may or may not remember that I am a ProtonMail user. ProtonMail is an end-to-end encrypted email service. It's a SaaS service that is based in Switzerland, and they are marketed as security and, most importantly, privacy-centric. So the news essentially was that there was an uproar especially among the InfoSec community, because a lot of us use ProtonMail. And they were upset and felt kind of betrayed that ProtonMail would log IP addresses when in their privacy agreement or privacy disclosure, they had actually stated that they wouldn't log or track any IP information. But because they are based in Switzerland, they received a legally binding order from the Swiss Federal Department of Justice to start logging some IP or whatever information they could on the device that was associated with a ProtonMail account as well as IP addresses that it was originating from and hand that information over. And because they are a Swiss-based company, they are obligated to comply. It's illegal for them to refuse these requests. 
They have to comply with Swiss agencies. They have to uh, comply to assist foreign services such as Europol with their investigations if they receive a legally binding order. No different than if you're an American company and you receive a subpoena from law enforcement or the Department of Justice. You can't just ignore that. I think an an example of what a lot of people may pivot to and say that what about ism type, you know, question is the whole Apple and iOS and San Bernardino shooter incident where Apple defied the Department of Justice, which I would say is a little bit different because Apple did comply with the subpoena to hand over the iCloud information that they had the last iCloud backup which as we've said on this show is unencrypted so the FBI had the latest iCloud backup but what they wanted was the encrypted material on the phone and in that case they wanted Apple to re-engineer their operating system to put a backdoor in it and that's not something that you know you can just do on the fly where in this case the Swiss government was asking ProtonMail to log ip addresses which probably is just a flick of the switch right you're just turning on logging by default proton mail doesn't log their ips and they still don't it was just because of this legal binding order so again you know it's interesting in the fact that there was so much uproar because people were saying oh i'm Looking for an alternative to Proton Mail. Let's boycott Proton Mail. Um, I do think that they didn't really market well because, I mean, if you have the ability to I- track someone's IP, then you probably shouldn't say that we'll never track your IP, right? I think that's what they had, and, and that's where probably the confusion is. But I don't think, in, in my opinion, I don't think they really did anything wrong that would lead me to distrust the company. Yeah, I I think there's a couple things to unpack here. First, just to touch on what you mentioned with the Apple incident, uh, with the FBI and the San Bernardino case, it's important to note that what the FBI was asking Apple to do was to create a new work, was asking them to do effort to do a thing, to make something new. And that's very different than like producing material you already have. I am not a lawyer. Andy, you are not a lawyer. um, So I don't think we can really get a whole lot deeper from a legal perspective than that. But just to highlight the difference that I I think there's a fundamental difference in providing uh, discovery based information. That's that's a common legal process in this country, in the United States, compared to forcing a company to create something new that doesn't currently exist, like to go to, uh, you know, to take an example like Dell and force them to make a new laptop. Like that's a totally different thing than say, produce the records you have. Those are very different requests. So I think that's point one. Point two is every company and I think Proton Mail actually said this in their kind of response, unless they're literally in an offshore platform somewhere in international waters, it's going to be required to comply with whatever the legal environment is of where they're physically located. And there are a lot of countries that are, you know, various levels of, of democracy or, or republics and they're going to have different legal environments in all of them. And I'm again, not a lawyer, not an international law expert, but my perception is that Switzerland probably has a more favorable legal environment than a lot of other places. A service like this could be located. There is no perfect place to locate this where you are above the law again, unless you want to uh, run fiber to the middle of the ocean and set up some sort of offshore platform, then knock yourself out. But otherwise, you know, escaping legal requirements is not feasible. So there needs to be an understanding that that's always going to be, um, and a limiting factor in wherever service you use and, and wherever they are geographically located. So I think that's the other, you know, kind of critical point to understand here. Yeah. And po- Proton published a response where they said, 
it's not you're not really bypassing the encryption so that's important because the contents of your emails the contents of your calendars your contacts that can't be accessed in fact proton is an end to end service so they don't have the keys to your data if the FBI were to do a subpoena and try to subpoena one of its U.S. citizens, they could possibly hand over the encrypted blob, maybe, but they certainly would not be able to hand over anything that is readable. Unlike other companies like Google, absolutely, they have the key to your email. They can hand over clear text email to any legal subpoena. The other thing that I thought was interesting is that there's actually an article in the Swiss criminal code that makes it illegal for any Swiss company to give data to foreign governments. So in that case that I was just saying, it it might even be considered illegal for Proton to hand over the encrypted blob to U.S. government agencies. So that's, like you said, Adam, there are a lot of worse places that... Proton could be headquartered and have their servers. I think Switzerland is probably by far one of the more favorable areas. And just by having their servers in Switzerland, they do have to comply with Swiss law. So um, the other thing that is important is also email and VPN are treated differently under Swiss law. So Proton, the parent company has email, but they also have a VPN product and because it's a different product under swiss law per the law logging does not have to be compelled by swiss law to be turned over to the authorities so they don't log ips at all on proton vpn and they can't be compelled even by swiss law to turn on logging for vpn for email yes and you know, they, they also responded that they're going to update their privacy policy and basically took down that they're, that they're not logging because they, they can now and, and we know that they can. Um, and the other thing is, is that, again, you know, the difference between security and privacy. Like, if you truly wanted privacy and anonymity, well, ProtonMail offers a Tor service. And if you're in InfoSec, I mean, you know about Tor. It's obviously for... Purposes of usability, it's a lot slower because you're routing through all those those different Tor points. But if you truly want anonymity, access Proton Mail through Tor. They have that available. They have a Tor node that, that you can access. So, um, anyways, that's those are my thoughts on that. I, I still, for me, I definitely support the company because I do think that they are a a leader in the privacy space. I think they're trying to do the right thing. I think they probably made a mistake in the marketing here as far as, you know, how they worded a lot of things on their website, but, um, you know, I'm, I'm still going to continue to use them. I think they are extremely secure. If I send email from my proton mail account to another proton mail account, I know that it is end to end encrypted. Right. And so, uh, from a security standpoint, I think it's very, very solid from a privacy standpoint. I think they're very good, right? I'm not using my mail to to do any illegal activity. So I feel pretty safe on that. And uh, that, those are my thoughts. Email is, I, I can't think of another provider that's end-to-end encrypted off the top of my head for email, where your email that's stored at rest is encrypted in a way that's not accessible to the service provider. I didn't know ProtonMail did that. I knew a lot of people used it, but I thought it was just more like because you could pay for it and not have ads and stuff. I actually didn't know till recently that they were end to end encrypted. That's extremely rare in this space. And so again, it's like you don't really have a lot of other options anyway. And email by its nature, because it dates back to the founding of the internet back when it was ARPANET, uh, just is, is not a secure platform in general. Um, there, there are certainly better ways to have communications that could potentially be sensitive than, than email. Uh, but ProtonMail is going to give you the best possible assurance um, to make sure that that is also secure from that perspective. And I think you're right. I think for the most part, 
Proton Mill is not guilty of really doing anything wrong, except perhaps over promising a bit in, in some of their uh, privacy language. But I, I think there should be an expectation that anything that's like fundamental to how you connect to a service is potentially logged somewhere and, and can be retrieved later. Uh, IP address is of course, fundamental to how the internet works. You, you have to have an IP address to make a connection. Now, can you attempt to obfuscate that through tools like Tor and VPNs? Absolutely. Are those bulletproof solutions? Absolutely not. So, you, you know, you can only do so much and have so many layers of burner phones and everything else where, uh, maybe there's just better ways to handle it. But I, um, I, I don't get a lot of the uproar here. Andy, you were telling me in the pre-show before we went on the air that there were some folks who, who essentially said that proton mail should have defied the legal order from the Swiss authorities and not complied with it. And to be honest, that doesn't surprise me. <laughs> and I, I apologize because <laughs> I'm going to generalize a little bit here, but there is a certain like anarchist, a uh, branch of kind of the open source software community that like all software should be free and nobody should sell software. And I think sometimes that bleeds into some of the, you know, the extreme privacy advocates as well, where like nobody, you know what I mean? Like get rid of all the structure. They're also probably into crypto as well. Like if I were to really paint with a broad brush here, but I, I, I guess I'm not surprised to hear that, but for the, pragmatic folks who are listening to this conversation. Um, hopefully you all understand and, at, and at least recognize that, uh, again, organizations are going to have a, a legal mandate to comply with the law in their local, um, community, you know, whatever kind of, uh, governmental structure they sit within. So keep that in mind with any company you do business with, that that is going to be the law that ultimately governs them at the end of the day. And, um, you know, I think people put a lot of faith in Proton Mail, and I don't think it was misplaced. Again, I still think Switzerland is a really favorable place to have a service like this, but it doesn't mean you can escape the law. And and so I, I, you should really, you know what, in the show notes, read through Proton's response here, because it's really written in very plain language. And it lays out, Andy, you mentioned like there's that article where they can't hand over data to foreign governments. There's also things in there like, they have to notify somebody if um, their their information is being produced to authorities. Like in the United States, you can have absolutely secret subpoenas that you never know about. That's where you get like warrant can canaries and stuff like that on a lot of sites. And uh, that's a whole concept for another time. Um, or, or also like that the Swiss government um, won't recognize... Uh, requests from from other countries that don't have a fair criminal justice system. So there's there's a lot a lot of good here uh, around how they operate, and I think again it's about as favorable as it gets. So you can you can do as much as you can, but ultimately this is kind of one of those it is how it is kind of things. And I know that's not a great response sometimes, but we have to be realistic. Um, and pragmatic with our expectations at times. And again, I know there's that anarchist wing that thinks information should be free and privacy should be universal and there should be no laws that inhibit privacy. And, you know, I agree with a lot of those concepts too, but, you know, we, we live in a world of rules and take it or leave it. Sometimes you, you kind of have to take it. Yeah. And like you said, there were some responses on there as well. It's like email is insecure. Right. Even if it's end to end encrypted, like just by default, that protocol and that method of communication, I was listening to a different podcast and they said, you know, if you really want something to be private, if you really need something to be uh, anonymous or, or secure between you and another person, go to a public place, throw a blanket over the two of you and have a conversation face to face. <laughs> Because, you know, like to try to block out any listening devices and there's no paper trail. Because if it's on the internet, there's a paper trail. There is going to be tracking and logging of some sort that can forensically be <laughs> tracked back to you. So... <laughs> <laughs> that reminds me of Goodfellas when they used to get in the car and blast the radio when they were talking to each other so they couldn't hear it on the wire. Yep. Yep. Good times. Yeah. <laughs> so, I, again, I, I think... Uh, this is uh, th there was no need for the uproar. Um, you know, 
both Adam and I are big privacy advocates as well. I try to do as much as I can. Uh, sometimes it seems like it's futile against, you know, Big Brother, or Google, and, and all the other things. Um, like, for example, this week when I was watching some of the Surface events, and then all of a sudden all of my ads on every single YouTube video that I'm watching or whatever is now Surface Duo, and I'm like, please stop. I know, I know it's really great, but I don't want to buy a new phone right now. Um, so, uh, you know, we're, we're certainly supportive of, of any company that's trying to do this. Um, and I, I think Proton is a leader in the space and they're going to continue to be that. So anything else to add, Adam? No, I, I guess ultimately just wrapping up is again, no, your geography, know where your service providers are based. Uh, not that you need to be an expert in their laws, but if you are going to be kind of skirting the law, maybe educate yourself on it and then use tools available to you as, as much as possible, um, depending on the sensitivity of your conversations and make sure you're using the right tool for the job. Uh, there are options out there like Tor, like VPN that can help, although are not bulletproof themselves. And again, um, we live in a world of rules, take it or leave it. Um, you, you know, you're going to have to comply with the law where you're at. So the companies are going to do the best job they can within those constraints. And I, I think Proton does a good job. So, you know, I, I, again, ultimately this whole uproar comes down to better communication and better understanding of what, what is and isn't going to be captured. But if it sounds good, too good to be true, it probably is. Well, that's our episode for this week. Thanks for tuning in. Our contact information will be in the show notes if you have any questions or want to suggest any topics that you want us to talk about. We'll talk to you guys next week. Thank you for listening to the Blue Security Podcast. Please check out the show notes, catch up on episodes you may have missed, and subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Find Andy on Twitter at AJawZero and Adam at AJ Brewer. See you at our next episode.